Europe travel tips from expert tour guide Dennis Callen. I am Chris. This is Yellow Productions. I do travel guides that are fun, informative, entertaining. And today, by the magic of the internet, we are joined with expert tour guide and YouTube channel host Dennis Callen. Dennis, welcome to the live stream. Hi, Chris and everybody. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Uh, so Dennis has led over 80 tours to Europe. He also has over 2,000 videos on his YouTube channel, recently passed 100,000 subscribers. Pretty exciting. Dennis has been doing this YouTube travel thing for a long time. Actually, when I was just getting started on YouTube, Dennis, I think, already had a ton of videos up on YouTube. Uh, and so in today's video, Dennis is going to share with us uh, how to save money in Europe, where to find the best food, um, and some of Dennis's favorite routes by travel by train in Europe. But before we do that, we're going to find out a little bit about Dennis. If you are watching the archive and you just want to get straight into those tips, um, I'm going to put like a link in the description to the timestamp for that. And so it'll be in one of the chapters up here. Uh, but so Dennis, Let's get into a little bit about you, and then we'll get into your tips. Uh, so how did you get into the tour guide business to start leading those 80 tours? Well, I've been a, a tour guide for about 30 years, so it's quite a while now. And the way I got into it was uh, due to my photography. I took a trip on my own before I was a tour guide or even thought about leading trips to Europe in 1985 with a still camera, and I shot a uh, thousand slides. It was like... No, 3,000, 100 boxes of slides. Back That's a lot of slides. And started putting on slideshows in my community here in Honolulu, which is also where I met my wife. And I started getting uh, a bit of a following from these slideshows. And that led into uh, talking to a friend of mine who ran a little travel agency. And he set me up on my first Europe tour, which was a bus tour. And I was basically just along for the ride. I had recruited uh, a dozen customers to come along with me and so I learned a lot from being on that bus tour and I also learned that I didn't want to do any more bus tours nice <laughs> nice and so my my travel career has been all about uh, traveling through Europe by train okay well very and, cool and uh, so what, it's a great what... way to go we can talk a lot about that during our segment here yeah, for sure. So uh, traveling by train and 80 tours, what, what kept you, you know, starting it from that first tour bus to then doing 80 of them? Well, my love for travel. Uh, as a little kid, we traveled around. I was a military brat in Long Island, London, California, back to Long Island, then college in Rhode Island, and then Honolulu by the time I was 21. So I traveled in my youth and was always an interest, a great interest of mine. And uh, that trip in 85 was a mind blower that, that really changed my life. So I just kept doing it. And, and the joy of being a tour conductor is, well, you're getting paid to travel. So that's a pretty good deal. That is a pretty good deal. And also, even, even beyond that, you're having the satisfaction of, of bringing a group of people through some of the finest places in the world and telling them about it and educating them and giving them the opportunity to learn so much and also managing the tour, working with people, being uh, friendly and easy to get along with and all those important things that go with being a travel agent, as well as knowing uh, when to let them go off on their own. People need free time. Uh, my trips were pretty structured. I'd have a daily calendar and usually the morning was pretty full with walking tours and whatnot. But always time, free time, and then evenings free to go out and have a nice meal. Yeah, cool. Well, what? So, what you know, you... It was a dream job. People, yeah. people, when I tell people what I did, they go, oh, God, you're so lucky. And, and I, I am. And then, and then, Chris, to add to it all, the creative element of documenting every trip with my video at the same time. And this is how I accumulated uh, so much video footage over the years to make those couple thousand movies that I've created and uh, that that was really an added bonus and it was good for my travelers because they all got then a, a nice video program months later after the tour was over yeah that's cool and so what made you decide to take those videos to youtube and maybe not just keep them for yourself or not just share them with those travelers well there's a deeper story there uh, i i got started making videos 30 years ago before there was any youtube sure. and my start was uh, showing the videos on uh, the Honolulu Public Access channel. Right on. We still have public access. But back then, public access was something that at least a few people watched, not many, but 
I, I did gain an audience uh, over the years. I was on public access for 20 years. And, and during that time, I had as much as 10,000 phone calls altogether from the viewers. And that, that was how I got the tour business rolling, not through YouTube, but through public access. But all that creativity of making movies for public access um, really taught me how to make movies. And I've applied that skill into the YouTube project, which I've been doing for about 15 years now. That's cool. I'm seeing in the chat, uh, people are saying you have a cool setup behind you. Dennis, first of all, can you can you tell us where in the world you are right now? Uh, and then tell uh, yeah. us maybe a little bit about what you got behind you. <laughs> well, I'm just showing off my editing system. I, I use um, five different monitors, six monitors sometimes with a, a Mac Pro desktop computer to run it all, uh, operating with the um, Premiere Pro video uh, editing system only takes about 20 minutes and you're rolling through so some of the prettiest Umbrian countryside you'll ever find and the ride up this is what I do all day <laughs> I sit here at my computer and I'm even though we've been locked down for two years with COVID I've been vicariously on tour uh, the whole time I I put in a lot of time editing you know how long it takes to, to make a video it, it takes me a lot. Yeah. Oh, eight days to make a 15 minute video. <laughs> and you know, we make a little money from YouTube, right? But it's less than minimum wage. I yeah. think when yeah, you sure calculate is. the hours that we put in. Yes. It's the, it's, it's the, it's a thing that we do for, for passion, all of us YouTubers and, and to uh, share with people what, what we're doing. That's my motivation. I, I don't really need the money to, I'm not doing it for the money. Uh, I'm doing it for the creativity, the act of creation. It's so satisfying to finally finish that 15-minute movie after those 10 days of work. You're more prolific. I don't know how you do it with your long-form um, videos and, and your full-time job. I no longer have a full-time job. I'm no longer leading tours. I, I retired from that. It was a great career, and now I, I travel, but on my own. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have this large uh, crew of pandas. They help me with all the editing, so it's kind of like an editing oh, panda factory that goes on here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Dennis, before coming to YouTube, did you have any like filmmaking experience before it, or photography experience? Well, as a kid, I was always interested in uh, photography. I had a camera as a young kid. Of course, that's before the days when everybody had video. Nowadays, everybody's a filmmaker. If you're ten years old. But I had a, a, a eight millimeter film camera when I was in high school, and I did a little shooting, not a lot, but I did a little bit. And then uh, really not much until later in my 20s and got involved in it once again, and that never stopped. Yeah, right on. Well, let's go ahead and get into some of your travel tips for Europe, uh, and let's start with itineraries. Yeah, you, sure. You mentioned well, one, that- one tip. Let, me, uh, let me change my screen back here. I got a, a more pleasant, screen maybe just with some Ooh. nice pictures for my little backdrop while soothing we here we go travel tips yeah. yeah isn't travel fun it's just it's such a great experience especially if you do it right but you know nowadays travel oh people go on cruises used to be people went on bus tours and that was a painful way to go in many ways but now now people go on cruises and that's kind of a lazy way to travel. You just sit back and then you arrive in a port, the buses pick you up for your three hour excursion, and then you're back on board the ship, uh, back to the buffet line and the bar and the evening entertainment. And that's what, that's not my style of travel. And so my videos are not geared to that at all. I've, do, I've done a Greek cruise video, but other than that, uh, I'm, I'm all about walking tours, getting into a city, and spending some quality time. Uh, hey, it could be half a day. It doesn't have to be two, three days or a week. You, you can go to a small town, like the project I'm working on now is small towns of uh, Umbria. And you, if you know what you're doing, but yet you wanna know what you're doing. So let's talk about yeah. what are we doing? Yeah, for sure. Well, and and I know as a as a tour guide, right, you probably had some favorite routes through Europe. So what what, what were some of your favorites? Oh yeah, I definitely uh, developed itineraries uh, for my tour business. Uh, it was things that uh, that I put together myself based on 
my own interest and recognition that these are the important places to go. So I, I've got half a dozen European itineraries and um, they are my favorite. My main itinerary was Rome to London by train. And that hits the highlights. Uh, three days each, here we go. In Rome, Florence, Venice, Lucerne, Paris, and London, and traveling by train. And so that gives you enough time in a place that you can really do some quality walking, do some exploring um, with me as the guide, learn where, where the basic streets are to go. If you don't have a guide, then you want to do your preparation ahead of time. But we, we can talk about tour prep um, slightly later. But those, those six cities, that's the place. If you haven't been to Europe, I suggest you do this. Now, I also have descriptions of these itineraries on my other website, which is Tours by Train. And that has got, I used to use that for promoting my tours. So I have fairly detailed descriptions there, uh, but I'm no longer selling it. I'm giving it away. So these have now become do-it-yourself guides on my website, Tours by Train. And there you'll find, uh, there we go, thank you. Uh, you'll find uh, a lot of information about each of those, those places on that particular trip. Italy, my favorite country. London, my favorite city. So uh, that itinerary really puts it all. I, I did that trip 30 times. <laughs> so Wow. 30 times. Yeah, that's awesome. And you and didn't get tired of it never, after that. Never the... got tired of it. Yeah. And, and uh, that too says something. There's no harm in going back to a favorite place uh, over and over. You'll you'll get a lot more out of it on repeat visits. I'm I'm with you. Uh, people always say, Chris, aren't you tired of going to Tokyo? But like every time I go to Japan, I'm like, I need to go to Tokyo because I just love that place. Um, mm. But I know you had some other classic itineraries. What are some of your other favorites? Yeah, after let's this talk one? about some of them. Uh, there there is the. Uh, would, do you have a slide? Maybe on the next one up on the slides, we can go with that. My my Central Europe trip. Uh, yeah, look at that. We're starting out in, in Heidelberg and then down to Munich. Again, all by train. Beautiful trains there. And these are pretty short rides, two to three hours. On to Salzburg and Vienna, over to Budapest, and then to Prague. And then we double back through Nuremberg on to Frankfurt to fly out at the Frankfurt airport. So th these trips are about 18 days. Uh, I would find that for group travel, 18 days was about enough uh, that most people could handle. And it gave us uh, two to three days in each place. So these are classic uh, Central Europe destinations, uh, such beautiful cities. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's, I, it's, I just love every one of them. A standard people question. Pe a standard question people always ask uh, is, you know, how, how much should you budget for like a trip like this? Uh, and and obviously yeah, you, you probably well, had a price tag on take, it, but yeah, go ahead. If I were to estimate the cost of my trip. Uh, today, of, of any uh -huh. of these trips, really, that's per person sharing a hotel room. It would, and um, this includes the airfare from Hawaii, by the way. So that's about another two thousand dollars. So let's omit the airfare. Uh, ground only for eighteen days is about four thousand dollars per person, and that does not include lunch and dinner, or souvenir shopping. Yeah. So uh, let's make it five to six thousand dollars. Now, this is traveling using nice hotels, three stars and some four star hotels. You could do it more cheaply uh, with a two star hotel or a, a no star hotel or a thousand star hotel <laughs> sleeping outdoors. <laughs> nice, nice. That's there you go. A thousand star hotel sleeping outdoors. I love it. Um, Rhonda asked the question which country do you get the most value for your money in in Europe? Well, that would be Eastern Europe. Um, I haven't gone too far east, but of those countries we just saw, certainly in uh, Prague and, and Budapest, the uh, the dollar goes, your money goes uh, better than it will in, in the other big cities. And also, if you go to small smaller towns in uh, any part of Europe, it'll be less expensive than going to the famous big cities. So, yeah, Eastern Eastern Europe... But most people want to go to Western Europe. Uh, frankly, that's my bias. That's been my experience. I, I would like to get beyond Budapest someday. But uh, as far as Western Europe goes, it's not cheap. Uh, that's, that's definitely true. But l l there's ways you can save some money, as I mentioned, on the hotel choice. Um, also, traveling by train, you can go second-class train. Uh, now, depending on your 
itinerary, you might want to buy a rail pass. Um, rail Europe is the, the main source of rail passes. You can go on their website and see what they've got. Or if you were just, let's say, in Italy, like I'm heading uh, for northern Italy in May next year, I'll be traveling around from one little town to another, you can just buy tickets on the spot. Or if you're in the south of France, in Nice and the Riviera, uh, you can just buy your tickets on the spot, and it can be pretty cheap to do that. One of the great bargains is that taking the bus from Nice to Monaco, it, it's about two euro. It's a one-hour yeah, bus ride cheap, cheap. along the most beautiful coastline, and it, it costs two euro. Because, you know, the Europeans, they subsidize their transportation. So uh, the European uh, taxes go to help pay for your ticket. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I know uh, rail passes. Uh, when OC Girl and I went to Switzerland a few years back, you know, we bought the Swiss rail pass, and it was just that's the, a good the, deal. Yeah, the trains in Switzerland are just fantastic. And um, oh, let's talk about Switzerland. Bring yeah, up, bring up Switzerland. Yeah, it it is so beautiful. Uh, I did a very extensive Swiss video series that you can uh -huh. find on on my channel, on my YouTube channel. Uh, I've been I've been to Switzerland a number of times, but uh, I, I did three really nice tours, comprehensive trips through the main destinations, and those videos have gotten more views than any of my other videos. So that it's a very popular place because Switzerland is wonderful to get around by train. You mentioned the the Eurail, the Swiss Rail Pass, that is a good value. Uh, with the groups, we would go first class, which is even nicer. Yeah. But second class, um, every bit is good. The train gets there at the same time, and Swiss trains are oh, they're all comfortable. And on time Sometimes too. Second class, the windows slide down, and you can get a nice unobstructed picture or fresh air or what have you. Whereas in, in first class, they don't. So very often, I'd be running back to second class to roll the window down, and have the Swiss. Um, curse me out because they don't want the window open but i get my shot and then put it back up again but nice. yeah switzerland it, the towns are pretty and obviously the scenery the mountains the hiking the cable cars and everything is so efficient and the people are quite friendly they all speak english the ones that you'll be dealing with they're well educated hospitality has um, been in their economy they invented hotel hospitality really tourism. The, the first Victorians uh, from late 19th century would go from England on down to Switzerland uh, along their grand tour. So yeah, th it's a great spot. So that itinerary, I would go to Interlaken, a fabulous place as a home base, because from there, uh, you're right in the heart of the Bernese Oberland. So you're near the Schilthorn and you're near the Jungfrau, uh, an easy several hours by train from Interlaken to get up to the tops of both of those mountains. There we go. Interlaken. And then down to Zermatt, a unique town with no cars. It, the whole town is just pedestrian oriented. And you've got the uh, not just the famous Matterhorn, but uh, you've got uh, other great mountains all around Zermatt to, to go up and do some hiking. Uh, I would go in the month of May. I, I really like um, late May, early May, not so good because there's still snow on a lot of those mountain trails and then you can't walk on them. If they're covered with snow, you can't see the trail. So avoid early May. Late May is perfect, or of course summertime. Uh, it'll be a little more crowded, but you wanna save a little money, you wanna also look for the shoulder season, uh, which is May and October. Any place in Europe, May and October are ideal times to go. Dennis, there's a question uh, from Points Traveler about sleeper trains. Do you recommend people in Europe take the sleeper trains between cities? The high-speed trains? Sleeper trains, people that oh, train sleepers. sleeper cars. You know, yeah. the sleepers are coming back. They, uh, I, I've been on a few sleepers many years ago, and, and they kind of went out of fashion. But now there's a lot of uh, companies, yeah, and sure, you, you can save uh, in some ways you save on a hotel bill and you save a night because you're in transit and it can be uh, can be very efficient so certainly putting in one or two overnights on a, a sleeper can be good uh, so some of these trains it doesn't have to be a sleeper if it's first class 
the um, well in the old days they had these compartments. Nowadays it's not so much compartments on trains anymore. It's more like airline seating. But with the compartments you could pull the seats together, which I did a few times and sleep just for free. <laughs> no extra charge that is. But yeah, the sleepers. Well, yeah, why not? Uh, I'm looking forward to doing some of that myself. Nice. Uh, a question in the chat too about. What's your favorite country in Europe? You mentioned that Eastern Europe is cheap. You mentioned that everybody you take wants to go to yeah, Western Europe. What's you know, Dennis's favorite? Favorite, favorite places wherever I am, but uh, it, in truth, Italy. It's got to be Italy. I, I keep going back to Italy. I've, I've been there 40 times and uh, keep going back for more because of those little towns, those historic, well-preserved pedestrian lanes and the old stone buildings and the relaxed lifestyle and the food and the wine and the mountains and the the train service is good uh it's quite efficient in italy it's improved a lot over the years and there are just so many towns to visit it's astonishing tuscany and umbria each have got at least 20 places that would make a, a good destination and that's only one small chunk of the country and then there's rome and florence and venice naturally so it's it's got to be Italy, but Switzerland, France, and England uh, those are my other go-to places. And favorite city is still London. The I guess the language is uh, helpful, and it's delightful to hear that accent. And the theater and the pubs, and and the city itself is really a series of villages all connected together, and makes uh, for great walking. It's three stories, four stories high, so you're not overwhelmed with gigantic high density. And it's just as pleasant as could be. And the buses and the tube and the river boats are all good for getting around there too. And then you're in striking distance of the rest of England. Now there's another tour I do. We can talk about England, England, a British Isles itinerary. Sounds good. I've done that trip a number of times. We start out in, in London. And then, yeah, we go down to, to Bath, uh, again by train, and then up to York, over to the Lake District. You, to get from York to the Lake District, uh, it's tricky to go by train. Now, uh, England has some problems with <laughs> some of their routes, not so good for trains. So uh, we would usually commission a private tour company. You can do it by train. It's just a bit of a roundabout. The tour company would take a drive through the the uh, the dales the yorkshire dales are so pretty and then uh, time in the lake district windermere and so on uh, staying in bonus is a good place to stay and then again to get up to edinburgh by train uh, oh, almost impossible so there too we'd have a, a bus you can go by bus we went by private bus and then uh, do a day trip out of edinburgh up to the highlands and then back to edinburgh the same night Edinburgh is such a great city too, and then we fly over to Ireland, and do a. a in Ireland, if you're on your own, you you could go by train. Uh, it's somewhat limited, but you can go from Dublin to Galway by train. It's just two hours. Take you over to the west coast, and Galway is just a beautiful city, a wonderful place. You can also go from Dublin to Killarney, and to Cork by train. So you could do it. But I find that Ireland is better handled either by driving, uh, just rent a car, you're driving on the wrong side of the road, but the roads have improved a lot. Or um, who can do a tour? Now there's a place for a bus tour. I was knocking bus tours earlier, but there certainly are uh, appropriate places to do a bus tour, and the British Isles is one of them, and um, certainly Ireland is another one. Bus tour, sure. Yeah, speaking of Ireland and, and accents, when OC Girl and I went to Ireland, and by the way, we did that train from Dublin to the, the West Coast, and that was a lot of fun. But the accents, we were like, are these people speaking English? I, I think it's English, <laughs> but you're like, wow, it's impressive. Yeah, but the, uh, the the British accent is definitely, you know, it's kind of the front, the fun, proper accent, right? I feel like somebody's reading a, a, a bedtime story of Peter Rabbit to me or something when they speak <laughs> in that proper British accent. <laughs> Um, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, living in London as a little kid for three years uh, made me that much fonder. I, I was there from when I was uh, four, five, six, and seven. Right on. In London. And I had a British accent <laughs> that I, I lost in about 
two months in California. I'm sure. At age seven. Now I don't uh, have any accent. Uh, living question. in Hawaii for 50 years, but no no local pigeon. Yeah, no, not not yet. Speaking of living in Hawaii, somebody asked, where can they get Dennis's cool Aloha shirt? Yeah, Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, Tori Richards. Tori Richards. All right, very good. I buy my Aloha shirts from Costco because I always find they have a pretty good uh, set of Aloha shirts uh, okay. in Hawaii. So, yeah, they're pretty uh -huh. good. Um. Then we and got some more itineraries. Uh, while we're on itineraries, you want to talk? Kick out another one. Let's do it. Uh, what you got? Scandinavia and Russia by train. <clears throat> we fl we fly into Saint Petersburg, and um, we have a local guide uh, take care of logistics and bring us on tour and whatnot. In Saint, it's worth about three to four days at least in Saint Pete to see all those palaces. And then um, we take the train to Helsinki. It's about a, oh, they got a high-speed train now, and so it's about four hours. And it's another beautiful city, Helsinki. Uh, just great, great spot. So many things to do there. And then we take the a boat. It's not shown on this map, but we take the ferry over to Tallinn. It's a three-hour boat ride with our suitcases. And we're not going to spend the night in Tallinn, but <clears throat> we just deposit the suitcases at the ferry station and they have secure uh, lockers there and then we have a free day in Tallinn a medieval medieval city that's got wall around it and castles and turrets and cobblestone lanes and restaurant waiters in costume and the whole deal it, it's Tallinn is a great spot then we take an overnight ferry to Stockholm very comfortable ship it's like a cruise ship and then from Stockholm, it's by train over to Oslo. And then um, either an overnight ferry down to Copenhagen to continue, or sometimes we'll take the train from Oslo to Bergen. And that's a great experience. I've, I've got a video about that that's one of my most popular. I've had probably a million viewings on Oslo to Bergen. They call it Norway in a nutshell. And then you can, you take a book ride on a fjord as part of that trip to the the train goes to phlegm and then you get off the train and on a boat through the big uh, song of fjord you get to bergen and that town is also worth a day or two and fly out of bergen they've got a major international airport so that's a nice very nice trip it helps in st petersburg it really does help to have a local guide so you can you know, look into travel arrangements ahead of time to do that. You want to arrange things ahead of time in many cases. Maybe one more itinerary, and then we can talk about preparing for a trip. Yeah, sounds good. I'm just going to have one comment on this one, which is uh, you mentioned the Norway in a Nutshell tour. That is the first video I uploaded to the Yellow Productions channel on YouTube uh, was OC Girl and I doing Norway in a Nutshell, that we did that to phlegm, and it's like, snows so much that the vehicles there look like tanks because they've just got like you know all those treads on them uh and then we also did that overnight cruise ferry from oslo to copenhagen and realized or was it yeah no norway yeah norway to denmark and it was uh realized that everybody who was on there except us was buying alcohol because it's duty free and the yeah. duties for alcohol are like uh, you know it's like, a booze run <laughs> it's, it's same, a booze same thing run. with the helsinki to uh tallinn but yeah. I guess in Scandinavia, they do put a very high tax on alcohol, trying to discourage people from drinking. Indeed. Oh, uh, the Mediterranean. Yeah, Sharon Mediterranean. Another, oh, this is such a gem. It's a long trip. Bar Barcelona to Rome. Between all the, the trains and then the local buses and the local trains and uh, whatnots, the, there's about at least 20 legs of transportation. Uh, a lot of them are just day trips. But it's a very uh, lively itinerary that I've created there, starting out in that great city of Barcelona. Uh, one example of over-tourism. Barcelona has been suffering from too many tourists taking their housing, you know, Airbnb, and so the Barcelona has been cracking down on it. So a lot of my personal work is um, actually steering away from places like Barcelona to get to smaller towns. But uh, you, you can go there. You, you'll have a great time. Everybody can fit into Barcelona. And then by train up to Cacazon, uh, I've got a, a photograph of somewhere down below for you of uh, Carcassonne's castle 
at night. They, oh yeah, that's good. And and the map, Carcassonne is such a magical place. It, it was a, uh, as you see, a fortified medieval village with two walls around it, and turrets. And the on the interior, go back to that map, and you can see the inside of Carcassonne is really quite small. It's a couple hundred meters from one end to the other, and there are three little hotels, one of them deluxe, and many restaurants to take care of you. So it's worth spending a night or two in, in Carcassonne. And, and then back to the itinerary, we continue on uh, from there to Avignon, which is a major capital of Provence. It's just a fabulous place with so many day trip opportunities out to Nîmes and Pont du Gard and over to um, Arles, down to Marseille, Orange, there, there's so much to see around Avignon. You could easily spend a, a whole week there. We, we stay for four days. And the town itself is a largely pedestrian shopping zone. And there's the old Pope's Palace, which they have done an amazing job of uh, providing uh, exhibits inside. When I first went inside that uh, 30 years ago, it was the palace was just an empty cold shell with nothing. No furniture, just empty rooms. Now they've got assisted reality. You hold up an iPad in front of your eyes and it shows you what the room looked like. And fancy, they've fancy. They've got exhibits everywhere. The Pope's Palace is amazing. You know, the Pope left Rome for about 100 years. And they, there was three different Popes who lived in Avignon. That was the center of the Catholic Church. So there's a, a lot was built there and it's still standing. And then to Nice, which is really the... Oh, probably the best, I would say, in terms of so much to see in the town and nearby on this itinerary. Uh, you've got Cannes and Monaco and Saint Paul de Vance and Vance and other uh, towns nearby. Here we go. Nice and the French Riviera, Grasse, Antibes. Uh, they're, they're just and so accessible. You can take the uh, public bus from Nice up to Saint Paul. It takes uh, mm, less than one hour. And it's only a couple of euro for that. Uh, otherwise, along the coastline, the trains run. Oh, every 10, 15 minutes, there's another train coming through. And, and there's a place where you can just buy your tickets point to point, and it's quite cheap. Uh, also, in Nice, you can buy um, a special pass that's just for the Riviera. And, and that's inexpensive, train pass. Good for three or four days or a week or what have you. And so just lovely sights to see along the coastline there. And Monaco, what a town that is, what a country. Uh, the beach, the Pebble Beach of Nice. Nice, beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right. And so, you know, in all these go, places, go uh, let's kick over to hotels for a minute and hotel choices. Um, I, I always like to stay in a centrally located hotel. I, I don't care so much about the other amenities the hotel might have, or whether it's two stars or three stars or what have you. But being in a central location in all of these places that we're talking about is, is so important because when you're traveling, you really don't have a lot of time and you don't want to be wasting time having to take a train or a bus in from the, the burbs and or being in a location, a hotel location that has nothing to see around it in terms of walking. But when you're in a central location, Oh, you just step outside the door and take a left, and there's things to see all around you. Uh, you'll be eternally entertained by the right choice of hotel. So many times when I'm going to a new place that I haven't been before, not with a group, but just on my own, I'll, I'll study uh, Google Maps. I'll take a look at TripAdvisor, and uh, there's so many mapping apps now, Hotels.com and, and so on, Expedia, that will right away let you know where all these hotels are. It's so easy now. Used to be before the internet, you had to buy a guidebook and then try to figure out from this Europe on ten dollars a day. Of course, that was an advantage too; it was a little bit cheaper. But uh, you can you can get by um, on three hundred dollars a day. That'll cover your hotel and your food. I'd say uh, that's a comfortable minimum three hundred. Yeah, it's, it's funny, Dennis, you mentioned uh, staying in the city center. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Though the one one time that that backfired for me was when we were staying on a hotel right off the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And we got there on a Sunday. And I wanted to get, like, some bottled water. And I asked the, you know, person in the lo works in the lobby, I'm like, hey, where can I get a bottle of water around here on a Sunday? And he's like, around here on a Sunday? No. 
That was because <laughs> everything around the Champs Elysees that was like grocery stores was closed. You know, it was like because it's a business district, right? And I was like, okay, lesson learned. In general, don't arrive into France on a Sunday because everything's closed, right? Oh so, boy, yeah. And and arrive with hotel reservations. One time I arrived in Paris uh, with no reservation on my 1985 trip, and I had to leave town. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take wow. a train to another wow. city, to Rouen. Uh, on the 85 trip, by the way, talk about arriving on a Sunday or a holiday. I, that, again, that was my first Europe trip. I arrived from Hawaii and flew to London. And I arrived on a holiday. It was a bank holiday of some kind. And I come up in Hoburn near the British Museum. I was staying at a uh -huh. B&B nearby. Had never been there, didn't know where I was. And with a holiday, everything was closed and the yeah. streets were empty. Right. Uh, it was like a ghost town. I had nobody yeah. to ask for directions. Or, it was very disorienting. For but sure. But I figured it out finally. Well, and I would say that's one of the pro tips, like, you know, traveling to Europe or any country is like, check the holidays in the country you're going to, right? To make sure that you're not like, hey, I'm going to go there and it's it's Monday and it'll be awesome, except everything's closed because it's a holiday, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, unless you're a festivity buff, there there are all these festivals. And sure. There too, if you want to see a festival, you better plan way ahead of time and be prepared to spend more money for your hotel. But uh, they have those festival calendars and it. It's really kind of fun to be in a place where there's costume parades going by and all the dancing in the streets and the music. That has a lot going for it. Indeed. Uh, Rhonda in the chat wants to know how many countries you've been to. Have you totaled up that number, Dennis? Have I been to how many countries? Mm -hmm. I, I was counting the towns, if I may. I'm, I'm building this new website, uh, Towns of Europe. And I was counting the towns in Europe that I've been to, and it came to 200. So I was, I was kind of surprised uh, by that. I filled up many a passport with uh, stamps of, of countries. But really, in, in Europe, it's, uh, yeah, tours by train. And my, the new website, we'll talk about that later, is Towns of Europe. Um, you know, I, not that many countries, uh, maybe a dozen European countries. And I've, I've been around. I've, I've been to Asia some. I've been to South America. I led six tours in South America and um, have been on several trips to Asia, so quite a bit. Cool. But mostly I'm sitting home in Hawaii. <laughs> editing, editing, right. Editing uh, video. Yeah, and I've, because I get asked that question so much, I've, I've totaled the number for me, which is 27, but you know, there's all these other people that are like, you know, I'm trying to go to like 100 countries or whatever, and so, mm. Dennis, what, what do you think about, you know, what I would call um, check, check mark travel, to be like, hey, I just want to go to all these places, versus like, going to a destination, you know, for a longer period of time? Where, where are you on that spectrum? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that, that brings up the related issue of the, uh, the selfies and people going to a place just to get that selfie shot. And yeah, sorry, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't cut it with me. I'm, I, I just don't do that. And, and they don't even see the place. They're, they're there for a quick check on the bucket list and get their selfie shot and then take a picture of their friend and then off they go to someplace else you know moving along you, you want to slow down there's something called uh, slow food mm -hmm. leisurely meal and there's related something called slow travel and you want to drop anchor for a while and, and stay in a place and and while you're in a place you can certainly keep busy and buzz around and you want to also have to take a little time to sit down at the cafe and watch the other people go by yeah, on that notion of selfie travel, I, one of the videos I did was, um, you know, tips to travel to Los Angeles. And I was in front of the Staples Center in Los Angeles, a big icon where they do basketball games. And I got my tripod set up and this tour bus shows up right next to me in front of the Staples Center, lets out a group of 20 people that literally are out of the bus for one minute to assemble, take a picture in front of the Staples Center, and they literally get back on the bus, and there they go. And I'm like, wow, that was, you know, you, you, I don't even know why you stopped, because you could have just seen it from the window for the city, you know, right? It's like, uh, nope, yeah, I had what's the I point? stand what's in front of What's the point? Why not just uh, stay home and watch a YouTube video? If you can't do that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, so you want to slow down a little bit and smell the uh, flowers and all, all that kind of thing, and, and, and meet some locals. You want to stop and, you know, bother a local on the street corner and ask them, uh, what's the name of the street? Or... Do you know a good restaurant around here or things like that? And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think yeah. we kind of wrapped up the itineraries. That those were my biggies, my, my big trips. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Uh, I've been to Spain tour also, but I'm I'm really not as uh, experienced in in Spain. And there I go along with my my friend who was Spanish who was leading the tour. But another great country to visit. That's Beyond awesome. Barcelona, no question about it. Yeah, let's let's hit traveling like a local. Uh, and so a lot of people say they want to travel like a local. You mentioned meeting the locals. You mentioned slow food. How, how do you think people best travel to travel like a local? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's hard, you know, because we're not locals, but we can at least try and, and fit in uh, somewhat. Um, you want to say hello. You want to say bonjour. You enter a French door. You say bonjour. You find out what are some of the local habits, the local customs. You want to be polite, not not a rude traveler. Remember, you're a guest in, in their country. But um, it's always nice to meet some locals, and it, it can be done. It's a little harder if you're with a group. If you're surrounded by 20 people all the time, or again, you're on a cruise ship and you're three hours in a port. But if you're walking around in a town, uh, just ask somebody, uh, especially younger people, they'll probably speak some English. Don't try and stop anybody who's in a hurry if they're rushing along or rushing across the street. But you might just uh, smile and say hi. And um, if you're looking for a destination that's nearby, ask them perhaps. Maybe they'll uh, walk you over there. That's happened before if they've got nothing else to do. So it, breaking the ice uh, can be pretty easy. If you're just a little bit outgoing, you don't have to be a total extrovert. But it, you'll find it's a rewarding experience. Or you're having dinner, you're in a restaurant, and there's a couple at the table next to you. Well, strike up a conversation. Ask, well, what are you eating there? One question will do it. It opens the door. And then you're into a one-hour discussion with those people sitting there. It's happened to you. It happens to anybody who, who wants. And it's really some of the best memories of the trip. Yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of meeting locals, Rhonda asked this question. Are the people in France really rude? Oh, they're not. They, that's they're just another myth of travel. Um, they're they're not. They're, they they can be very friendly. Just listen to the language. Listen how beautiful the language is, and the the kiss on the cheek when they greet each other. They're kissing each other. Of course, they're not kissing too many tourists, but um, they're fine. Now, French waiters are a little bit notorious. They, they often like to be gruff. They they play at being gruff. But okay, well, so be it. But you know, there's ways to deal with waiters. Uh, let's talk about food. Let's yeah, segue that's, into food. That sounds good. Mmm, getting hungry. Picking restaurants is a challenge. Uh, the, the problem is that the tourist trap pitfall is going to a restaurant that's on a big, busy piazza. A main tourist, any main tourist destination is going to have a, a row and circle of restaurants nearby. And you have to be wary. Don't discount them all. Um, some of them really can be surprisingly good, but you have to be careful. And so some of the things I look for in looking for a restaurant are walking around just on my own. And it helps if you're looking at the dinner hour. So you can see, is this place empty or popular or, or what? And you want it popular with locals, not with a line of tourists out front. Of, Beware of TripAdvisor number one, two, three, four, five listings of restaurants. Beware of all that because you go to that restaurant and there'll be 20, 20 tourists waiting outside and the place is packed with tourists and the restaurant is so fat and lazy now because they have that high recommendation, they don't even try. And so you're going to have so probably true. some bad so service true. and mediocre food. So it's up to you. You have to, you have to do it yourself. You have to find the place yourself. And it's really quite easy. There's restaurants all over the place. <laughs> you get two blocks away from the main drag and you're going to see the local restaurants. Okay, so you identify a restaurant that looks good. Well, it might have a tourist menu outside. That's okay. Don't, don't be turned off if you see tourist menu. It's, it's pretty common. And it's often a very good deal. So you look at that. You know, you'll get an entree and a, you know, a couple of, couple of courses. You go in a restaurant and you'll sit down and you look at the menu. And up oh, the tourist menu is not there. <laughs> they'll they'll offer it to you if you ask them, but instead they have their normal menu, uh, which does not have that discount. So if you do see an attractive tourist menu, make note and you know ask them when you go in. Okay, so when you go in a restaurant, I've got some good tips for you. First of all, look around, listen, and smell. So use your senses, use your brain. You want to look around first of all 
to see. Let's let's assume it's fairly crowded, uh, you know, half full. You want to look first of all: Are people eating? So many restaurants you walk into and it's half full, and nobody's eating. They haven't eaten yet. They don't have dirty dishes on the table. They don't have anything. They're waiting. And so I immediately turn around and walk out. Now, if, if they've eaten and there's still dishes there, that's another animal altogether. Or if they are eating, great. Even if it's crowded and everybody, most everybody seems to be eating, well, you're going to have some good service and probably some good food. Now, listen and see if you hear mostly the local language. If you're only hearing um, the tourist English, then, well, maybe not so good. Keep going. Move along. Okay, so you sat down, you've ordered your meal. And the uh, waiter uh, brings you the course, brings you the meal. Ask for the check when, when he brings your meal, if you're not having dessert. And I don't usually have dessert. I'm just having, you know, an appetizer, a salad, and an entree. So when he brings you the main course, ask for the check. Because why? You might be sitting there a long time after you're finished eating, waiting to catch the, tater, the waiter's attention. Now, maybe he wasn't so busy when you first sat down at 8 o'clock, but now at 9, 9.15, the place is packed, and he's very busy, and he's not paying attention to you, and they don't have peripheral vision. They are blind to any peripheral vision. No, they, they, <laughs> unless they want to talk to you, they, they don't want to hear from you. So, he'll go, what? You want the check now? He say, yes, uh, when you can, if you would. And then he'll usually fail to do it. So the next time you see him, remind him, oh, could I, could I have the check, please? So you'll get your check, and then you can actually pay while you're eating or just after you finish eating. And so when you finish eating, you know, our time is precious when we're traveling and we're tired. Come on, 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night, you've been walking all day. You're tired. You want to go home and go to bed. You don't wait around another half hour. So that way you can leave when you're done eating. Those are all super great tips, Dennis. I, I think particularly the ones that you gave about uh, <clears throat> look at restaurants if people are eating. You know, and this is one like you mentioned the busy restaurant on the piazza, you know, and I'll, I'll do this too. But there's all these people there and maybe they're not waiting, but they're drinking, right? They've got like booze on their table, but no mm. food. You know, and so mm -hmm. it's like, okay, this is a place people go to drink, or this is a place where people go to smoke, or it's a place where they go to get coffee and they go to socialize, but it's not a place that people actually go to eat. Uh, and then you mentioned the one about all the reviews on TripAdvisor, you know, oh, Seagirl and I, we've been burned once or twice in our travels, as I'm sure you have, you know, with things where you're like, this restaurant's so busy, let me get in there. And then you realize at one point, the entire restaurant clears out because everybody else that was in there was on tour group except for the two of us. And <laughs> then we're like, oh, this is <laughs> this is a great restaurant. You know, only tour groups uh, come here. Um, oh, but you'll have great food. There's so many. Oh, it's one of the, the highlights sure. of travel. There's no question. However, if you really want to save money, if you're really pinching pennies, then it's cheaper to eat at lunch than it is uh, in, at night. You might just have a very light snack in, in the evening. You can even, you know, go to a grocery store and get some takeouts and bring it to your hotel room in the evening. Uh, maybe a sandwich, uh, and, and uh, usually lunchtime meals are quite good and, and less expensive, so that's another option. Another tip I have as a photographer, yeah. if you're interested in twilight, which is always a nice time to be out taking pictures and also just walking without a camera, just your eyes will enjoy it. Uh, I try and avoid uh, sit, sitting in a restaurant at twilight, so I'll, I'll go after twilight in the dark. That's when the Europeans are eating at eight or nine, or in Spain at midnight. You know, yeah. they, eat, they eat late. Yeah, they sure do. Uh, so uh, there was a question in the chat. Uh, actually, not a question, a comment that I just wanted to read. We were talking about your monitor setup earlier, but Nick said uh, your monitor setup is so from the year thirty twenty one. So just in case people yeah. didn't see Dennis's full monitor setup at the beginning, there it is. Um, now, one, one of the things that I think is really important in Europe, uh, and not just us talking about your monitor setup, but one of the things I think is really important in Europe uh, is for people to stay safe. So how do you advise people to stay safe from thieves and pickpockets? Yeah, it's an issue. <clears throat> I've, been, I've been pickpocketed six times. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> they only got me the first time. That was down in a, a little town in South America, in Peru. Uh, all the other times I stopped them or caught them or, or what have you. Uh, but it's really simple to protect yourself from that. And that is to wear a safety pin on your pocket. And mm. I always hand out safety pins to my travelers and I encourage them to always keep your pocket pinned because there is no doubt there are lots of pickpockets in Europe. And it's not just Amsterdam. Amsterdam has become relatively safe, I think. Um, every city you go to, you know, and it's also not just gypsies with cardboard in front of you. These are very, uh, some very <laughs> clever people. But even with the safety pin, oh, I was in Barcelona doing some filming of a parade and I had my camera held high above my head and I was watching the parade with my pocket safety pin. Nice. And I felt a bump on my pocket and I swatted the lady away and... And she said, oh, well, she pointed to her iPhone or some nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ah, she can't get me. And minutes later, I'm going to a bank machine to, to get some money. And she had undone my safety pin. She didn't get anything, but she undid my safety wow. pin. Wow, impressive. Oh. Skilled. So maybe yeah. two safety pins. If you're right. And you can buy travel pockets uh, with zippers. That's another option. But I think a safety pin is, I was vulnerable because I'm tall. I wasn't paying attention. I was, you know, watching the parade. Yeah, well, that's a that's a good but tip. But don't worry Dennis. about it. They're not going to shoot you or stab you, uh, mug you. Um, that that doesn't happen. A uh, question in the and chat. Don't carry a lot. Don't carry your passport with you. Don't don't carry a lot of cash. So you can't be uh, deprived of too much. Those are good tips. A uh, question from the chat from Rhonda. She asked if there were any countries or places you've been to that you generally didn't feel safe. Where I did not feel safe? Yeah. Well, no. Uh, you know, taking those precautions and um, also maybe like for a single lady, not walking um, on your own at night on a, a dark, lonely street. But uh, no, the countries, the countries I've been to have been fine. I was in Peru in the late 80s during the Shining Path Revolution. And, and that was a little scary. But that was an a, unusual situation. We we were not allowed to go out at night. <laughs> we, we were wow. locked down. Yeah. But that's all gut finished now. Peru Peru is safe as well too. That's a uh, that's a little harsh. Well, uh, Dennis, t tell us about your new website that you're putting together. This uh, towns of yeah, towns of Europe. A, it's a, a brand new one. It's just under construction. In fact, only the last week I've been starting to build it. Uh, my web skills are somewhat medium level quality, but uh, I'm working on it. And it's called townsofeurope.com. And it's already up and available, but it's under construction. So I, I put together the Netherlands part of it so you can take a little look there. But the ultimate goal is to have a very uh, good, detailed, and useful descriptions of. 200 places at least in Europe, so 200 of the, the fine towns to visit and to provide description, maps, photographs, uh, some websites, web links. And, and this will be a site that's uh, not selling anything. I'm not selling any tours, not selling any hotel rooms. There, there's no ulterior motive. There's, there's no uh, profit motive, although I'd like to get some attention with the site and maybe it'll draw people to my movies too because there'll be a lot of links to the YouTube videos on there but that's all well and good part of the uh, educational approach of this website so my my slogan is authentic honest content and it will be the real deal and also I'm, I'm hoping that people the viewers will participate not just by looking at it but by contributing by joining in I'm, I'm gonna make it open to contributions from other people who have been to places that I've never been. And so if you want to send me uh, an email, there's an email uh, address on that website. Send me a, a tickler. You can send me some text, for example, a little story you might have written, some pictures, and I'll, I'll build the page onto this website and I'll give you credit, byline credit, and put a link to your website or your social media or, or what have you. So, you know, we can all help each other out that way and, and help the traveling public by building a very robust information website. Right now, th there, there's no single website that you can go to 
for saying, oh, I want to browse around in Europe. Where are some places to go? There, there are some. There's um, Rick Steves is a good example that's pretty comprehensive. He's one of the champions, obviously, of uh, travel literature, uh, travel writer and, and producer. So his is pretty good, but uh, not in great detail, not at great length, even there. Time Out is another pretty good website, but there are always, uh, many of these sites are just filled with ads and links, and they're, they're just really distracting. You, you're searching Google, and you think, oh, okay, here's a pretty good site, and you go to it, and it's, oh, it's all links for selling stuff. So this um, Towns of Europe will be different. It'll be a non-commercial, not selling any products, not taking any paid placements, not taking any free trips or anything like that. Maybe mention some hotels, you know, if you've been to a hotel and you really like it, to, well, or restaurants, shopping area, sure, tell, tell us about that. So I'm, I'm hoping that people will help me out. It's going to take me many months to, to get it built, but by the time people in your archive are watching this, there'll be more pages built out. Right now it's in the Netherlands and it's got a long way to go, but it's a fun project. You know, I, I built my other websites and the Tour Videos website is a good one as an index of my videos. And the Tours by Train is also a, a good one for those itineraries that we talked about already. Um, you can go to that and you'll find a lot of the uh, information already available on Tours by Train. But this Towns of Europe will be more comprehensive. That sounds good. Well, I look forward to uh, a catalog of Europe travel that doesn't have a lot of pop-ups or pop-unders or pop-arounds. Uh, well, Dennis, it comes to this time in the live stream that we do a giveaway. Yes, it's the time okay. you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. And as usual, I give away a Yellow Productions crew shirt. We're going to ask Dennis what he was drinking in a moment because everybody wants to know, I'm sure, because everybody wants to know what I was thinking, <laughs> drinking too, but we'll get to that. Uh, but so the question to win, uh, well, you, can't, you can't see my Yellow Productions crew shirt logo. Here we go. The Yellow Productions crew shirt right there with that logo on it is what does Dennis advise that you put in your pocket to stay safe from pickpockets. If you answer that question first in the chat, you will win a Yellow Productions Crew shirt shipped to you anywhere in the world. I'm just drinking a plain old normal iced tea, but Dennis, what are you drinking out of that orange cup of yours? Carbonated water. Yeah, mm. plain old water for now. Car but carbonated water. Like a like soda water or a particular type of carbonated water that you like? Yeah, just just soda water. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then this evening, a uh, couple glasses of wine, and lately I've been drinking uh, some non-alcoholic beer to go along with that, too cut down a little bit, control my wine wine consumption. Oh, wine. We haven't talked about the wines of Europe, but you know all about it. It's inexpensive. You go into an Italian restaurant, get the house wine. It's cheaper than the water, frankly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it tastes better. For sure. Well, I'm seeing a lot of people answering the question right in the chat. But, oh, good. Uh, but, but They're the, paying attention. But the first person, so we'll hear, we'll run the winning animation. And now we have a winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right. And so the winner, I, for some reason, I can't pull up the chat message on the screen like I usually do. Like I usually do. But the first person to say safety pin is Gilberto Carmona from Brazil. This is a very special win for Gilberto, Dennis, because Gilberto has now won 10 times. His last win was number nine, and he sent me a picture, and he said, Chris, I am going to win number 10, and it's going to be soon. And he sent me this picture of wow. himself to say, Chris, for <laughs> this <did> <laughs> occasion, I bought the number 10 shirt. So, Gilberto, that is awesome. Thank you for always being on all these live streams, as with Gilberto, everybody here. Gilberto, great Brazilian uh, name, There we go, too. Gilberto. Gilberto is the biggest chicken dinner winner. There we go. So that's uh, Ooh, wow. that's that. All right. You have well, an international audience. So like myself, you know, with my videos, by the way, it's 75 percent outside America. Yeah, that's impressive. I think uh, I think I may be 60 percent outside America. But uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. y YouTube is such a small place, right? It's like, you know, and people people come from all over. So I think it's, it's, it's a great feeling, you know, getting back to why are we doing it? Just that satisfaction, you know, of entertaining people and all the comments that you get, the email comments that you get on your videos, it's, it's really gratifying, a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, for sure.
for sure. Well, uh, for those of you that know Dennis already, please thank Dennis for being on here. If you haven't, you know, put a thumbs up on this video so Dennis knows you appreciate him being here. Uh, send him some love in the comments, the chat, the archive. Uh, if you if this is your first time seeing Dennis, he's a wealth of information about Europe and another place in the world he's been to. Uh, make sure to head over to his channel, check it out. You'll find a link in the description to it. Dennis, I'm going to yeah, give you the last word. My, so my go. channel is my name, Dennis Callan. That's the go. name of my channel. There you go. That's it. And uh, you'll find that link or you can just, that was the wrong button, or you can just go ahead and search it right there. Dennis Callan, two A's right there. So, all right. Dennis, again, last words to you. I usually say, uh, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in the next video, but say whatever you want here at the end. Well, Chris, I want to thank you. And also, I want to thank all of my Hawaii travelers over the years, the ones who kept me going for these 80 tours. Uh, without their support, and their repeat business, they like my trips and coming back again, I, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this, shoot any of the videos. So thanks to them. Thanks to my wife for her patience while I do, do all this stuff. And thank you, Chris, very much.